um, <clears throat> and uh, we'll just have this. Uh, if anybody has a lightning talk or something they'd like to do, uh, please approach me. But uh, if not, Daryl with uh, Cyber Walker. Hey guys. Okay. So, hi everyone. Um, I've been using Linux for about three or four years, um, mostly at home and in non-professional environments. So that's a a bit of a disclaimer for how you take the knowledge that I give to you today. <laughs> um, and I've been reading one of the books I've been reading lately is called Countdown to Zero Day. Um, and it's all about the uh, sabotage of the Iranian nuclear program. And, um, yeah. Okay. So the first first thing I'm... First part of my talk is just about basic security stuff in Linux. Um, the, just basic things we, we should all know are um, IP tables, firewall... D and firewall config and ch rootkit and RK Hunter. Is everybody okay with these? Has everybody used these before? Mm -hmm. Anybody not used these before? Okay, so um, RK Hunter is just a command line thing. You just type in RK Hunter and it checks your um, your machine for rootkits, which are stored in the um, initial RAM that boots up with the boot boot system so they just they hide very very deep inside the operating system and RK Hunter and CH rootkit pretty much do the same thing if you don't know how to set up a firewall um, you can just type in firewall config and that'll give you a GUI so easy peasy um, how do hacks work some of the common ways that hacks work um, how, how many people are familiar with stack smashing So, so stack stack smashing is pretty easy. What you what what you have happen, for example, is if somebody has to enter a password, and that um, the program they're entering into the password, they enter the password too long, it'll go into adjacent memory squares and then put data into those uh, memory squares. So it's a means to change memory addresses in the computer by um, kind of forcing your way in. And then there's um, injection, which has got lots of different ways of um, going about it. But yeah, um, so anyway, the meat and potatoes of the first part of the talk is about uh, discrete access control versus mandatory access control, DAC versus Mac. So usually in Linux, what you'll do is you'll see your permissions on a file like you type in ls and you see this belongs to root or this belongs to user Gregory or Jonathan or whatever and you, you have permissions like you can read the file or write the file or execute the file but that's all that's all sort of like up down you know somebody has root access and they can do anything and access anything there's a there's a program that has root access so you've got a program in Linux called NTP that sets your time and so um, NTP needs to access the root of your system in order to change the time. So if something were to compromise something like NTP, name time protocol, um, network time protocol, excuse me, um, then that could potentially get anywhere in the system. So what mandatory access control says, uh, for example, the first first example is about Apache server. It says Apache server can only access things relative to Apache server. Apache server can't access your Etsy shadow file or the, the file where your p passwords are kept. So what it says is Apache server can go um, can go anywhere Apache server is allowed. It can't go into your home directory unless you say it can. And uh, mandatory access control or at least the SE Linux that I'm about to talk about, 
uh, works with labels. So as you, that HTTP can access HTTPD, that's that's the label for Apache server or unless you're using, if you're using something that isn't Apache, I suppose it might be that or might not. Um, but yeah, so so that's that's the idea. Um, enforces the idea of least privilege. That means that if your name is John and you work in accounting, then the idea of least privilege says that you can't access the printers, even though you're not likely to do anything to the printers, uh, or it wouldn't matter if you could access the printers, you can't access them because least privilege says you can only access the files and the data that you're supposed to access. So Linux security models um, was something introduced and created by the NSA. That's what we're talking about. I'm talking about Mac mandatory access control, and um, they proposed it to um, Linus, I think, and they said they wanted to make it part of the kernel, and he said no. You've got to make it a module that plugs into the kernel, and um, then then I think now it actually is part of the kernel. But it was done by the NSA, the National Security Agency. Of the bad guys or good guys, depending on whatever you think of them, I don't really care. But it was released by them under uh, GPL in December 2000. So SE Linux and AppArmor are, are two of these sorts of um, mandatory access control um, systems, services. Um, and if you're, if you're running Ubuntu or OpenSUSE, then you'll be using AppArmor. Uh, which, for the most, which contains like small profiles that sort of go on to something like Firefox has a profile and it says what Firefox can and can't do. So you, just like I was talking about the network time thing before, you've got things that access the root of the system. You don't want, you don't want Firefox to access your passwords just because at some point it needs to access the root of the system to render fonts or something. Um, so SE Linux is mainly what I'm going to be talking about. And if you use SE, who's used SE Linux? Okay, that's cool. So I'll be I'll be talking about something new. So SE Linux is really exciting. Um, you can you can learn every every command in terms of searching around the system you need to know with SE Linux is done with a capital Z. So LS capital Z. Uh, PS, capital Z, for your processors, all your processors, all your sockets, all your files, they all have a label. So, for example, a label would be, like I said before, HCT, HTTPD for Apache server, and it's this label can access that and that, okay? So, yep, um, and it's in the format user role label, and I'll, I'll go on that in a bit. So, um, yeah, it, I'll, I'll just pop up a terminal because I want to do some uh, do some real things, not just not just speak to you through the slideshow. If I can get it up there, let's have a look. Might have to close this guy. Whoops. Okay, so if you has anybody got uh, Red Hat or Fedora who's running something like that? Yeah, so you're gonna have you're gonna have SE Linux. So when you get SE Linux, uh, just to check it's on, type get enforcing. Whoops, get enforce. Yeah, enforcing, and um, that'll tell you whether it's on or not. And um, so I was talking about capital Z, ls dash capital Z, and then we can see right now the, it's got unconfined U for user, object R, user home T. So the type is user home T, and we're only really considered in worried about the type right now. The, the R and the U, uh, I think that's something else called role based, act for role, role based access um, control uh, that's that's a that's most most of the things aren't done by that in in my experience of what I've done so um, uh, 
uh, SE manage F context dash L. No, that's not it. What, what is it? Oops. I didn't realize I wouldn't wouldn't be able to see the, the screen quite quite so easy. I think SE set bool F context set s able <laughs> thanks man set s able oh i've got my got my commands mixed up and i can't see my notes um whoops Hey. Oh, okay. Um, so, yeah. So you can. Oh, se manage boolean l. What are, What did I try the first time? Se manage boolean dash l. No, that's not showing. Anyway, it doesn't matter. I can just go. Yeah. I've got to go into root. That's what I haven't done. Cause that's what it does. It won't. It won't tell you. It won't remind you that you're not in in root. Sometimes. So now I'm in root. That's okay. Um, but I'll just go to the root directory and I'll do a ls dash z oops oops ah okay let's have a look so so you've got system system file system type bar type bin type proc type user type so everything everything is locked in these um in these types so you don't just have one big uh, root that can access everything, and that's really, really good um, because you know, like, as I said, so many things need to access the root. And what I'm going to be talking about um, today has a lot to do with people exploiting those those root root privileges, mostly on Windows, but it it has been done in Linux, so it's it's a common sort of thing when you're using SE Linux. A lot of the stuff is uh, the configs at Etsy, SE Linux config, um, and journal, journal CTL will show you the uh, equivalent of var log messages because some some of the new versions don't have var log messages, so that's just yeah your system messages. If if S, if you have say for example. Um, If I if I have if I have a web page and I want to wait not one no two one two seven dot zero dot one dot one no dot zero dot one okay unable to connect have to just bring that over and turn on the web server okay all right that let's see what that should come up and it'll probably say forbidden or something
Okay, so forbidden, you do not have to access the HTML on this server. That's because I've kind of done this tutorial backwards. But um, so I'll go into the www ls oops ls this HTML ls okay so ls capital Z I can see that the index.html that I'm trying to access through the web browser is returning forbidden because it's in um, it's in it's in the directory it should be but it's got the wrong type and if I I'm pretty sure if I can just copy it and um, and usually they take the uh, yeah. So if I if I copy index to index two, now it automatically takes the permissions of the directory, which in this case is httpd sys content. So I will overwrite the original index, or I'll just remove it. Okay, and I'll move index2 to index.html. Okay, and then I'll come over here, and it's just got like some random text. Blag has to remember that. Um, yeah, so, so now you can see that it's accessing the page, and before it couldn't access the page because it was the wrong um, type. Is, are, you, are you getting that, the, the types and labels things? It's all about types and labels. Every, everything, every file has a type, any file you create, and it inherits the type of the directory it's created in. And um, SE Linux only works with file systems that support files having these labels. If the file system doesn't support having these labels, you can't run it with SE Linux. Um, That's the, unconfined. The, the unconfined one is like a, is like a default one. Okay. Um, but anyway, so what I wanted to show you guys, a lot of people just turn off SE Linux. They don't know about it. But if you're having any trouble with SE Linux, you can run Spelt journal wrong. There we go. Journal CTL dash F. Um, and I'll just um, I'll just change the um, context of that again. I'll just find out the name of a context. Um, you listed one was uh, so I can do ch con. Um, dash T unconfined underscore T index dot HTML see if that works no I must have got it wrong um, I'll just go to another directory and, and grab the name of one of those contexts so CD LS LS dash Z okay user underscore home underscore t so ch con dash t user underscore home underscore t whoops underscore t index okay ls dash capital z and we can see that it's got that user home context http apache server is not allowed to access the user home so i'll come back over here Whoop. Okay. And it's forbidden again. But while it's forbidden, I've had um, journal CTL running. And in here, in incredibly simple form, it tells you um, if you want to allow this. It tells you S it tells you in red SA Linux is preventing this. And it also tells you if you want to if you want to do it, then you have to tell SE Linux by enabling httpd underscore read underscore user content boolean. So it even tells you the command to make it so 
so that you can just turn that on if you want. There is another program that I've used from time to time where <coughs> you set SE medics to be permissive. Yeah. Or even if you don't, it doesn't really matter. But uh, in permissive mode, it logs the information. Yeah. Uh, and just like it does in non permissive mode, but permissive mode will still let it do everything. It's, yeah. It'll just log that it's been blocked. And then there's a program called, uh, uh, what's it? Uh, SE, SE Troubleshooter? Allow. Oh, no, okay. Sorry? Audit to allow. Audit to allow. <laughs> yeah. And then Audit to allow will look at the log files. Yeah. Pick up what's being blocked by SE Linux. Yeah. And output a script that will set all the settings so it's, everything's allowed. That's, that's, that's pretty easy, pretty good. Yeah. So nobody nobody's got any excuses for not using SE Linux anymore. <laughs> so that way you can just run it for the day. Yeah. And then at the end of the day or whatever, just run the order to allow, and it'll output the script that will set everything that you've done to be allowed. Cool. <clears throat> um, so yeah, capital capital Z, everything. Um, what else? Oh, here's some examples of the types. Like I was just showing everyone, you got the resolve dot conf for resolving your name stuff and um, and if you, if you can create a user and give them a group and they'll have that show up in their user name and um, like I said the shadow so yeah is everyone happy with SE Linux you look you all look so excited right now <laughs> just about to jump out of your chair and just security <laughs> Okay, um, Pam. Pam's a good friend of mine. She makes sure that everybody does um, well. So does things, does all the correct security things. Got make sure your passwords correct. Um, if you if you haven't already looked in Etsy, Pam G, and you like Linux, you're missing out on some great fun. Um, Etsy Pam D. Okay. Um, so I'll just have. I wonder if I should be rude or it's going to let me do it. I think it'll let me. What's what's a good one? Um, password auth. Password auth, okay. And that's the one that everybody will use every day. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, yeah, you've got. Required, sufficient, and and requisite, and um, so you gotta gotta have the required ones. Mostly, what's what's something that's not too confusing? Can't really see it properly, but but yeah. So it will go through these, and it will. Um, Track down the uh, .so file. Who, who, anyone who doesn't know what a .so file is? Yeah. yeah. Uh, how many people know what a .dll file is? Vaguely. Well, it's pre pretty similar to a DLL file from Windows. So it's a library file. So you just, you just give it your library files. And usually it'll do this automatically. Sometimes it won't do it automatically, but it's... um. It, you know, if, if you if you wanted to have fingerprint or, or authentication or something, you'd probably have like fingerprint auth requisite my fingerprint.so fingerprint service program or something like that. Um, so yeah, that's what Pam does. And if if you ever want to um, if you if you ever want to do something like retina identification or you know create your own security thing, it's going to be in um, it's going to be in there. So compromising Tor browser. Who who's used Tor? Okay, I I thought Tor would be a bit more exciting for people in SE Linux. Um, so the way you can compromise Tor is quite interesting. One of the ways you can do it. So um, Tor Tor the Onion router works by bouncing off uh, a few three proxies, and then it's got an exit node and goes back out to the internet. It, is everybody okay with how Tor works? I, I sort of thought most people would know a bit about Tor. 
So, so it's just like proxying, bouncing off servers anonymously, one anonymous proxy after another with some other stuff going on. But what... Yeah. Yeah, so it, go, it goes through all those um, servers encrypted. But what you can actually do is, if you want to find out what somebody is doing on the Tor network, you can start compromising those Tor servers by sending denial of service attacks to them. And you'll see the denial of service attacks correlate back to the user machine once you start hitting those Tor servers. So, you know, you see somebody's internet connection that nothing's coming through. Somebody's probably, you know, top secret Snowden guy or something. Um, they can they can hit those Tor servers and look for correlate timing correlations. So a lot of a lot of compromising Tor is about um, is about timing correlations. If you're an idiot, then they'll probably get your browser fingerprint, and you should use the Tor browser. But even so, it can it can still get you, I guess. Um, and of course, if an end node can be compromised, then we can say, oh look. We've got this exit node for Tor here where he's going out to the internet to sell state secrets or something. And we just saw, you know, eight megabyte packet come in here and we just saw an eight megabyte packet hit his home address. So we know this is the same guy because we're correlating the packet size. Um, lots, lots of the people who have been caught doing dodgy things on Tor for example, the Silk Road, the guy who was selling all those drugs on the internet, they didn't really use that many high-tech things at all. They just parked a police officer outside his house and they said, called him up, said, Silk Road's just been updated. Yes, he's home. You know what I mean? So they just, every, every time Silk Road was updated, there was a police officer outside his house, undercover, who, who knew he was home, could see him on the computer or something through the window. And, and they just correlated, correlated the time. It's been updated, it's his home. It's been updated, his home. So that, that was easy. Um, and if, you, if you're a bad, bad Tor user and you access your Facebook or something like that, then, you know, that'd be pretty silly, though. Why is it silly? Zero identity. Well, I, I spot it, de it depends. It depends. Oh yeah, in, in that case, in that case, if it's only about where you are, depending on what you're using it for. Um, so why not? I don't say it's not silly. I just don't know why it's silly. I, I was just I was just thinking. I'm I'm thinking in terms of Edward Snowden or some, you know, dude like that who's out there sending, you know, sends the sends the helicopter video that Bradley Manning or something had, and then logs into his Facebook on, on the same tour. Through the same tour server would be pretty strange. This so, just happened to someone who broke into a house. He broke into the house, and uh, while he was in the house, he searched his Facebook. Yeah. And then the, it's the person, the owner of the house, came home to find their house broken into. Yeah. Oh, and lo and behold, my my computer's logged into someone else's Facebook. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It didn't take the cops long to find him. It's one better committing a crime than putting it up on YouTube. Yeah, a lot of people have done that, Pe especially in Australia. People like recording themselves with a beer in their hand or something, and then get. I was thinking going worse, like committing a criminal act, not a stupid act. Yeah. <laughs> um, okay. Well, this is. Um, how many people have already heard about Stuxnet? Okay, cool. So you all came here for Stuxnet then. Um, so Stuxnet is a cyber weapon that travelled via USB to attack the Natanz uranium enrichment plant. Um, in Iran, <laughs> um, sabotaging the Siemens programmable logic controllers by their Step 7 software which ran on Windows, which they were using to program the uh, logic controllers. And it, it's the first publicly known worm that made, um, um, made to target an industrial system that spread via a USB key, which as I'll go on, I don't think it's that amazing in some regards. Um, so in January 2010, um, officials with the I, IAEA noticed that the centrifuges were going bad at a strange rate. And um, uh, there was a bunch of, six months later, there was some computers that were discovered in Iran suffering from a permanent reboot loop. And this is where... Um, 
Stuxnet was sort of first, like, hey, we've got something here. It was this reboot loop that they couldn't work out. They they cleaned the computers, they reinstalled everything, and um, yeah, I guess Stuxnet must have had a bug in it or something to do that because I don't. That's not that's not the goal of Stuxnet, but that's what was that's how they found it. Um, it came in multiple versions that would update itself. The first version just exploited Windows a Windows Auto Run file. Um, usually they're just they're just plain text files, so I don't know I don't know if it was that crude. But then it was followed up by a LNK file. Um, Stuxnet uh, 0.5 was a really early version, which was confirmed in operation since 2007. But there may have been earlier things going on um, since 2005. And when Stuxnet hit Iran, it had two stolen digital certificates from JMicron and Realtek signed, and, Re and Realtek. So when I say as early as 2005, the Stuxnet in and of itself ran on kind of a, a platform that I'll I'll talk about. Um, it. The, the, in, in Stuxnet, there's two parts to so it. There's the part that spreads the, um, the virus or the payload, uh, and then the payload itself that's actually designed to do the damage, kind of like the, the vehicle and the bomb, or the, the missile and the, um, the, the payload. Um, so the, the early, the missile part is, is very advanced, and, and that is the part that was probably uh, been going on since 2005. Um, when Stuxnet hit, it played back code from from uh, normal time. I might have missed a slide there. So what what Stuxnet did was it attacks the uranium enrichment centrifuges. So when you when you get when you want to enrich uranium to make a nuclear power or a bomb, um, you kind of get uranium ore, but then you turn it into a gas. And then you put the gas in these these metal things. These are centrifuges, and as you can see, they're like seven feet tall and um, I don't know, ten inches or in radius or something like that. And um, they the, that each one of those is one big canister that just spins spins around really really quickly, and it throws all this sort of enriched uranium to the ends of the canister, and that's that's what you need. You need that really pure. Um, can't remember the number. I think it's uranium 231, 235. Is it two three two three one or two three five? So say two two three five. Um, so so yeah, it throws the throws the uranium to the edges, and and then that's the pure uranium you need to make uh, to make a nuclear bomb. So if if you if you're just doing Uranium for a nuclear power plant, you only you needed about twenty percent, five to twenty percent pure. I think five percent will do. But if you want to make a nuclear bomb, you need it like ninety-five percent pure for a decent nuclear bomb. And the, it's just a matter of repeating the process. So nobody wanted Iran to get a hold of these um, centrifuges and start using it because once they get good at using it, they can make nuclear bombs. And there were repeated attempts to check out the Iranian facilities and. And stop them from doing this, and um, the talks, the talks just kept breaking down. It was clear what Iran was doing. They had all the excuses in the world. They said they were using it for medical technology, and the United States tried saying, "Well, why don't you give us, why don't you give the uranium you mine over to Russia, who already has these centrifuges, and then Russia will give you back the uranium that you want for your power plants and your medical research and whatever else you need." But Iran wasn't having any of it. They said, no, we're working with our own centrifuges. They built them massively underground. And, um, you know, Israel wanted to bomb Iran. And if it wasn't for Stuxnet, probably probably would have. Um, so I'll keep. Um, OK. Was well, so, there some evidence that Israel was involved in Stuxnet, as well as some evidence in Turkey? Yeah, so in. in, in um, when you compile a program, um, sometimes the program, the, the compiled program leaves evidence of where it was on the hard drive and it had uh, references to the book of Esther in the Hebrew Bible. It was called like uh, 
something slash Myrtle. And Myrtle is the name of this um, Jewish princess who was married to an Iranian um, king. And the Iranian king was going to go and kill all these um, Jews in Iran. And then she went to the king and she said, no, I'm Jewish. And then so the Iranian king said he wouldn't support the massacre of um, the Jewish population. And that was one of the one in inside one of the um, files that the people who did this they're, they're, they're quite arrogant and there was an earlier version of Stuxnet called du Duku well came to be known as Duku which which had an image from um, the Hubble Space Telescope in it so they sort of they they want to send subtle messages so we don't know if they did that on purpose or not but um but yeah, like every everyone says that Stuxnet was would have been a joint um, Israeli US attack, or at least, um, or maybe even all Western powers would have been involved in it. Um, so so Stuxnet um, kind of lived on a normal laptop, and then um, it compromised the code that was being sent to the portable logic controllers because the they're not programmable logic controllers um, because they don't they don't have their own screen or anything like that they're not that sort of computer um, so it compromised the code being sent through and um, yeah um, yeah Stuxnet specifically looked for a setup of these programmable logic controllers, these Siemens Step 7 programmable logic controllers, and if they weren't there, it just didn't do anything. But Stuxnet still more or less spread anywhere it could by, via USB. Um, so it wasn't it wasn't out there to cause damage to the normal computers. Um, as you guys probably know, if, um, yeah, so it was just after those centrifuges. Um, and where, whether or not Stuxnet was a success is uh, up for debate. But if they were to bomb those um, plants, it would have cost a lot of lives and a lot of money. And it's it's certainly suggested that using a cyber weapon was much better value for money in terms of its destructive power than flying in with bombs and risking having um, that sort of problem. The, the international declaration of war or whatever. Um, so sabotage like this isn't a new thing. It's it's re it's actually really old. It's been going on for ages. And um, there was a dossier from the Soviet Union called the Farewell Dossier from a KGB double agent um, who, who was sending out information about the Soviet Union stealing Canadian technology on pipelines and the USA found out that the Soviet Union was stealing this information, this, this uh, Canadian technology, and started sabotaging the information that was going back in, into the um, Soviet Union. And there was a big Trans-Siberian Pipeline disaster in 1982, which is suggested to be a result of this um, compromised technology going back into the Soviet Union. So. When I, when I look at Stuxnet, I really think of it as a continuation of this sort of attack. It's just that the tools are a little bit different in order to do it. So I, I, think, I think what Stuxnet is, has brought to light is a, is a kind of unofficial war that countries play against each other underneath the service, surface where if they can have just a little bit of deniability, then they can avert the war. It's sort of like you know, they're, they're, they're shooting at each other, but as long as they can't see the, the soldiers, there's no war that's going to occur. It's, it's a strange situation. And this has continued in Iran with a lot of the technology that Iran purchased via Turkey, um, because Iran obviously has a lot of sanctions. It's very difficult for Iran to go and, you know, buy a truckload of things that make nuclear bombs. So they have to get a lot of that via Turkey and a lot of that stuff has been um, sabotaged via, uh, via that um, sort, of, sort of means. And in the Vietnam War even, they would fight fake battles and then they would retreat and they would leave 
um, AK-47 ammunition there. The Viet Cong would come through, they'd pick up that AK-47 ammunition, they'd fire it, the ammo was rigged and it would blow up their gun and shoot in their face. So this, this sort of um, dirty war is um, very, very old. Uh, okay, so zero days, getting back to Stuxnet a bit more. Um, does everybody know what a zero day exploit is? So um, I probably phrase is there anybody who wants me to explain a zero day? Okay, so a, a zero day exploit is basically an exploit. For example, Stuxnet works. One of the exploits in Stuxnet was um, the LNK file. Um, or oh, and, and e the easiest exploit I can think of is the is one that attaches to the the keyboard file, like I was speaking about with. DAC versus MAC, DAC versus MAC. How I said, if the if the network time protocol is compromised, because it has root privileges on the system, if that's compromised, then they can use the access of the network time protocol to steal your passwords, right? If you don't have that mandatory access control, because it's because something that has root privileges or administrator privileges can go anywhere else in the system. So the keyboard which has an interrupt going into the kernel and stuff like that has to have root privileges. So if that's been compromised and nobody knows about it and nobody's had time to fix it, then it's a zero day because once it's been used and once it's been reported, then they'll go and fix it. Think of it as the number of days after the discovery yeah. Yeah. as to when it starts being used in the wild. It's a zero day yeah. because it was already being used in the wild at the time that it was discovered. Okay. Yeah. Um, so zero zero days are selling for a lot of money, like a hundred thousand dollars. So if you go home and plug away at your um, Windows computer and find a way to get administrator access via something else that already has administrator access, such as your your keyboard drivers or your video drivers or um, anything else that's plugging into the core of the system, even um, something that renders fonts. So an another exploit was via a font, which had got, um, and I'll go on that in a min minute. Um, it's, it's, the, it's, the, uh, it's the administrator level. So anything that needs to have part of it to have administrator privileges, most things, like even when you copy a file, it's sort of got to go down into the kernel and say, this is what I want to do. And then, you know, it, so many things have to go down to that, but only a few of them are actually going to have exploits that people haven't noticed. Um, yeah, so, so if you find one of these exploits, you can sell it on the, on the, on, on the grey market for like a hundred thousand dollars and there's an article about the NSA purchasing zero day exploits from French security firm Vupin. So Vupin entered this Google hackathon thing and Google said if you can get through to our browser, if you can get through to the computer from through the browser, we'll give you like sixty thousand dollars and they won the competition and then Google's like, well he, he, do you want the award? And they said, no, we don't want the award. You know, we just want to show you that we could do it because it's, you know, $100,000 is a lot of money and they said they wouldn't sell their secrets on how they found these exploits for a million dollars. It's it's very, very huge. It's a billion dollar industry and it's all about, um, you know, finding, uh, finding those exploits. So another exploit is Adobe Flash uh, has to have... Is, just one. Just one of the yeah, just... Adobe Flash. Yeah, so Adobe Flash has always been the dodgiest fish in the sea. Really, really bad program that always has allowed like the server to find out that you have Adobe Flash and then execute some code off Adobe Flash and gain access to your system. Probably one of the worst security problems that I know about of the internet age would be Adobe Flash. Um, so people would used to just call up the vendors. People didn't ask for the money before. They were like, I found this exploit 
where I can access the root of the system through the keyboard, you know, the keyboard configuration or something like that. And and people didn't re it, it wasn't a big industry before. If you weren't a hacker, then you probably couldn't do anything with it, and the market wasn't there to sell it. Now the market is there, and the big worry is that like if you're if you're a security firm like Symantec or something like that, or Kaspersky or whatever, it might it might be like somebody might report an exploit and you might notice only one person or two people have reported this exploit and you can sort of pass that on to your government and say, you know, this exploit is here, we're going to fix it in about, you know, a month. So you got that, you, you give your government that month to play around with the exploit and they can attack foreign computers and get in there and that's, that's a really big ethical concern at the moment and some people are admittedly doing that and other people, uh, it's, it's it's suggested that everybody's doing it. Um, it's quite possible, you know. There's a lot of money in it. Uh, people want to defend their country, and giving your country access effectively to potentially any computer in the world is is a very profitable thing to do. Um, yeah. So this goes back a bit more to um, what I was talking about early versions of Stuxnet before because there was um, another another type of worm called which they came to call Duku because a lot of the things, a lot of the files referenced in it had like tilde D. In it. Anyway, that's why they called it that. Um, and it was sent as a .doc file which had to be open within two days. So I mean, I I wouldn't. I would never open a doc file. I can't imagine why, like you know, top secret people in India and Iran and stuff are opening these random doc files that they get. But a lot of them would be very targeted. Like somebody would go to a conference and then they'd send it. Here's the notes from the conference you just went to. Might even say something about the conference. But that would be the Duku would be in there and. It didn't, it didn't replicate automatically, so it didn't replicate via USB, but it would contact uh, command and control servers, which would say, which could tell it to replicate on a network. And it also contained a stolen certificate from a Taiwanese company called um, C Media. And the, the goal of this was intelligence, not sabotage, so it would you know, have a look around the hard drives, take some screen pictures and um, send that information back to command and control. So Stuxnet also had a command and control service which it was accessing by what appeared to be a football website. Lots of Iranians like football, so a football website would look, you know, okay in there. Probably pretty likely that a lot of those guys were, were into their soccer. And um, QQ would self-destruct after a while. Uh, flame. Flame Flame is a recent one that came about two years ago. It could be up to 20 megabytes in size if it collected all its modules um, as it was asked to from command and control. And it would do screenshots, audio recording, uh, Bluetooth, Stealing from mobile from devices within the area. It was a S, it's an espionage tool, and it was found everywhere from northern Africa, Middle East, um, and Eastern Europe were the main areas where flame was found. Um, and it has been it has been said to be active since 2008. It also looked for a lot of AutoCAD files. So it was looking for like architecture files of uh, buildings people might be building. We really don't know what it was um, looking for. But once again, um, there's suggestion that it was a joint collaboration between CIA and Mossad and probably probably any any of the Western countries that are willing to get along and uh, do this sort of thing. Um, and yeah, it, it looked it looked at people's bank accounts, but we don't think that it would have been used to steal money. We think it was just looking for who's sending money to who. 
So if somebody is funding terrorists or something like that, presumably then Flame would help them find out about that. Um, Heartbleed, everybody aware of Heartbleed? So Heart, Heartbleed was pretty, pretty recent, like, uh, does everybody know what SSH is? Is there anybody who doesn't know what SSH is? Hey? Um, but what was Heartbleed not SSH? Open SSL. I thought it was Open SSH anyway. Um, yeah, so the Heartbeat just kept the connection alive and um, and yeah, for some reason if you sent a packet to the server that was larger than it should be, it would just send you back random stuff in memory and um, like a re that, that, that had access to. So like going back to like SE Linux about this stuff, SE Linux would protect against a lot of this stuff because for example, like I said, if you found an export, export via the keyboard, something the keyboard does or via something that the font rendering engine that draws the fonts on screen, it, SE Linux and that sort of access control won't make it easy for that program to escape into the rest of the computer. But with regards to Heartbleed, because um, it's working, it's working over the open SSL um, thing, it, it could send back the uh, security keys because those security keys would be um, accessed by the SSL service. So that would be that would be in local memory to the SSL. Um, so yeah, what it what it did was it just sent a large packet and got back random data when the packet was too big. And it could also be done by the server to the client. So that if you logged into something that was running a heart bleed exploit, it could grab random bits of memory from your computer. Um, yeah, looking for SSH keys and stuff like that. Um, so this this was only reported in the news a couple of weeks ago. Um, is the Israeli corporation Holla VPN provides a free VPN service, and when you join this VPN service, um, one of the things in the fine print is that you can act as an exit node for that VPN service, and what 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 it also gave them the, gives them the ability to do is to create a a botnet that has about 10 million people in it because about 10 million people are being using this free VPN service. Now Holla VPN can sort of go to all of them and go, all right, everybody of these 10 million computers, you're going to ping this server over here and do a denial of service attack, and. Um, that's, that's pretty huge, especially when if you think about what I was talking about with Tor before, you could correlate this sort of thing and use it against the Tor network and, you know, you, you, you could just time it. You could just do like, um, you know, you've got your wanted list of the people you're watching and then, you know, 7 o'clock every night, then you just do your ping with these Tor servers and then those Tor servers and then other ones you could track down. You could do a lot of stuff with 10 million computers, um, so I I think that that could could pretty effectively be used against Tor. What do you reckon? Could be. <laughs> um, okay, so how could how can Linux be compromised? Um, so Linux Linux can be compromised. It's not as easy. I'd say to be as compromised as Windows because, um, well, for one thing, everybody has access to the source code and everybody who's a part of it really cares about it and doesn't want it to be broken, but SSL was running on Linux. So, yeah, um, that's one of the big reasons I spoke <laughs> about, as I've been saying, about mandatory access control, kind of locking off parts <coughs> of, the, of the system so that they can't access other parts of the system 
is is a really important <coughs> thing to to have to to secure the computer from itself effectively. Um, and there were, did, did anybody hear about shell shock? Yeah, so there was like an environment variable which could be run as root. Hey? Yes, you could run any command. Yeah, run any. As root as the user. Oh, okay, just as the user. Okay, I didn't find that much information about it. Um, yeah. And yeah, I, I actually had some, some malware like when I first installed one of the first times I was running Linux, it was about like six months into running it, but it was actually on Google Chrome. And any time I'd go to like YouTube or something like that, all these big ads would just fly up over every single YouTube video I looked at, and it made using Chrome impossible. And then about a week later or a few days later, they obviously released a security fix and it was gone. But for a couple of days, that was really annoying. Um, yeah. Um, so I, coming coming to the close, I think um, what what Stuxnet and these cyber weapons do is they they change the unofficial status of war. They make everything very murky and difficult to look at, like. For example, recently uh, Obama was complaining about Chinese spies looking at American corporations, and he said, "Yeah." yeah. yeah. <laughs> so um, he he was saying, you know, you can. It's okay for China to hack me and my email and see what I'm doing because I'm a public part of America. But once you start going after American companies and trying to steal the patents of what they're working on or something like that, that's that's not allowed. And of course, in China, like everything is part of the state. So, you know, like that that that's, you know, a very convenient kind of one way rule, you know, if you're depending on what is and isn't owned by the state, this this is this is very this is very um murky it's very it's very gray there's no clear rules here um, yeah there's no telling when somebody is going to go one step too far and it's going to cause a really major you know international incident like a war or something um, so there's no there's no there's no clear rules of engage engagement which is what makes this whole thing quite scary um, yeah, go, going back to what I was saying before about the Trans-Siberian Pipeline disaster in 1982, obviously there was no official war during the Cold War, it was just the Cold War, and um, the explosions didn't change that, just that little bit of deniability about how it um, occurred. Um, yeah. the biggest non-nuclear explosion that Yeah. The biggest. Yeah. Yeah, so that's pretty important. Like, really, yeah. Um, there's likely to be a lot of cyber weapons out there now. Um, and yeah, so do, looking into the future, I think we we have a responsibility to educate. Oh, this isn't isn't coming up there. Whoops. Looking at all the uh, attendees in this room. No, yeah, I I think that's a pretty um, interesting interesting thing to say. Like what what? Yeah. Cyber problems. I, I don't know. I'm I'm really not sure what they think because I think. I think they must have known that sooner or later some of these things are going to get caught, and they certainly didn't seem too worried about Stuxnet getting caught. Um, 
whether or not Stuxnet was a success seems to be unclear. Um, certainly, if you contrast like Stuxnet in terms of the damage, it probably did compared to the cost of bombing that place with planes. Like I said, Stuxnet would be a success, but they might have wanted it to. Stuxnet was most notable because it was the first. The first word, was, yeah. That was publicly disclosed. Yeah. There have been others since and some of them seem even much more that there's there was one that was um basically spying on loads of people and it was uh, module based and that they apparently saw uh evidence that it's been around for like ten years or something ridiculous like that. It wasn't wasn't GQ, was it? The this one? Because uh, that I don't know, mind me. One of the things I found interesting about it is they clearly seem to have like a team, like the, they, they're separating the teams and they could tell this by the way the code was compiled that people use different different languages and and the code that like spreads the uh, spread the platform is different to the payload and so they seem to have like a common platform that would be like top secret and then sort of like you know, I suppose. There seems to be a, a range of these sorts of things. Right? Yeah. That's the one that got the target in Kmart. That wasn't yeah. really a Trojan or a software. They got it through the air conditioning. They got it in through the air conditioning. Yeah, exactly. The target had all their air conditionings on a remote controlled network so as they could make sure that all the target stores had a nice comfortable temperature. And they got in through that. And then from there, they jumped to the uh, the desktop machines that are in the office and that sort of thing in Target, and from there they jumped to the uh, the FBOT machines, which are all Windows CE based and also on the same network. Also, <laughs> so yeah, <laughs> and so the lesson there was basically don't put all this sort of stuff on the same network. <laughs> How do you think? Do you think they would have had like proper access control on there, or do you think they just had you know? I don't think the key used. problem was that they had everything on the same network. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, why does the air conditioning system have to be on the office network? And you never put the FPOS machines on the same network as anything else. That yeah, that's asking for trouble. It's <clears throat> incredibly strange. It's scary as well. That yeah. Rely on Amazon cloud services and Google cloud services. You don't like you Amazon and cloud? Is it the government? Do some encouraging government. Yeah, but even if the smallest thing goes wrong on Amazon, then everybody's out in the country, and the company's going to go capsize. So yeah, I would have to imagine uh, that there'd be. According to the U.S. government, because Amazon and Google are U.S.-owned companies, they have access to all the data yeah. without an Australian warrant. As a matter of fact, Microsoft is in the courts because there's been a warrant served for one of their customers in Ireland. Yeah. And Microsoft is in a between two, basically between two governments. If they don't comply with the strict court order, they're in favor of the US government. If yeah. they do yeah. comply with the, the government court order, they're in uh, breaching the law in Ireland. So whichever way they do, they're in breaching the law somewhere. Okay. And follow the US obviously. It's the last I heard. It was all put to the side. That the the the, gut, the uh, court in America decided that yes, you do have to comply, but given your current situation, we put it on hold. So the whole thing was on hold, and then nobody knows what the hell's going to happen. It's got the metadata laws now, but it's all been approved here in Australia. So yeah, you could use a VPN or Tor for that. I'm not really sure what the point. Of it is. Even the VPNs, they can, uh, like you said, they can find the exit node and. Yeah, that and requires, it certainly makes it a lot more right. difficult. Yeah, that's a lot, lot more difficult. Actually, they have to have the ability to monitor multiple sites at the same time in order to correlate that information. Because what they're doing is they're basically watching what's coming in and out of this tour node and watching what's coming in and out of your home network and basically trying to correlate the data of an AP packet percentage in the home, an AP packet less from this tour node, and you know, they see the pattern. Statistically, it's likely that your data is going through this tour node. That's what they're trying to do. But it means that they have to be able to monitor the data at both ends. 
Tor, Tor still, Tor still has like, even the websites on Tor, they still have like a delegate and the delegate knows the location of the server storing the file. You don't directly access the server like Silk Road, you access the delegate and the delegate tells you the information from the server. So it's behind a proxy. But like, like I said about the guy um, who got caught doing the Silk Road, selling all those drugs all around the world, at the end of the day, they, the way they caught him was putting a police officer outside of his house. And the other stupid How thing... Find out who he was oh, this, this, is, this is fantastic, okay? Is no, 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 I'm talking about the Silk no, Road. No, 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 definitely not Bitcoin. He put PHP code of the Silk Road asking people how to help fix his PHP code before he put the Silk Road up. Right. And he put it under his own name on um, Stack Overflow, name. like his I mean, first and second name. Yeah. Um, it, yeah, so that, that one was really crazy. Um, and the other thing that they did to get him was they found the first reference to the Silk Road, which was on a website called Shroomery net or dot com and that was the first reference to the silk road and he's saying hey has anybody heard about the silk road you can sell drugs on there that was him again using the name frosty so so, so basically one or two slip ups and they had yeah. something on him and then they just needed to collect some evidence they got him the pirate bay is that is that how they also track the pirate bay pirate bay wasn't secret they knew who was in yeah they never tried to keep it secret. They were just trying to find the servers. Yeah, the servers. Of, 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 they, they, they knew the people. Yeah. And the only reason why they didn't get them from the beginning is because they were, they were uh, in a country that is quite lenient with these other things. So they sat around for many years and they brought it to the courts and they were trying to. It's only, if it's only recently that they finally managed to you know, close it down or is it closed down? Oh, it's not closed down, they've gone And I think the other end of the spectrum is how many times the uh, manufacturers of these various pieces of equipment and, and sites take the shortcut. They don't really do their job properly. Like, they're it's not manufacturers who do the job. It's people like you and me. They work for manufacturers that don't do the job. Well, here's one that's going around at the moment I heard about recently. Uh, you know, all those keyless entry cards. They all have those little keys that only have the key proximity to the car. Yeah. The way they work is they have a low frequency transmission from the car. The device sees that and responds, right? The device itself has quite a fair bit of range because it's using a high frequency. The car has a low range because it's using a low frequency. But the, the bad guys have figured out that all you have to do is boost the range from the car. And then you can get the signal from a much larger distance from the key. Uh, so if you're in your house, you know, you're still fast asleep, your keys are in your house, all they do is get a signal booster in your car. It boosts the signal large enough that your that your keys can then respond from you know yeah. fifty meters away or something yeah. like that. Yeah. Uh, and the That's key responds and that unlocks the car. And then they you know rifle through your car and take the one. Well the scary is like when you're locked in the car yourself. And it can't get out. And give me like, like a BMW or whatever. It's like somebody locks it from outside and you can't get out. You can't open the door, you can't open the door, open the door, open the door, and nothing. Smash it. It's been it's been it's been the the it's 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 the most of my friends have that. Yes. Really? Yes. Because of that problem. Well, most of that problem is if you 
know, if a car gets uh, runs off into the river or something, like yeah, that, you need to get out. They're screwed. Yeah, a, a lot of cars have it like mounted to the side of the car or a bus or something like that. It's like a little. Yeah, it's orange yeah. plastic panel with all red. Two little metal. Yeah, I know that one. Oh, that torch. Yeah, that used to be illegal because you know if you got in a car crash, they got to be able to open the door and get you out. So yeah. there's supposed to be safety laws about that. I find it pretty surprising. Hey, the the name of the guy who did the uh, Silk Road is called Ross Ulbricht because I kept calling him that guy. So, so was he? Um, I don't mean to be racist, but it. I saw pictures of um, a black guy, so it was the... No, it's the, the white guy. guy. Well, on the pictures I read, they had a black guy up there. So yeah, dude, yeah, that's, that was an ad, sorry. Got nothing to do with that guy. <laughs> no, I'm just saying, when they put pictures up, they won't always put the right pictures up. No, no, that's the guy. I've seen other pictures of Ross Ulbricht. Yeah. The, the article I read was talking about how Bitcoin got into the trouble because they actually traced him more. Yeah, well, the thing about Bitcoin is you can run it through a tumbler, yeah. and that everybody puts in a bit of Bitcoin, you know, you put in 100 Bitcoins, 100 Bitcoins, 100 Bitcoins, 100 Bitcoins. The Tumblr jumbles up all the Bitcoins and then sends them back out to different people. And so... Yeah, sort of like try to break the chain to see who... Like, obviously, uh, Bitcoin works with a chain of... Yeah, which okay, is public. History chain the blockchain, yeah. yeah. So I suppose that would break that chain. No, no it, doesn't, it doesn't break the chain because it just... It just it just means it goes from the tumbler. So if you have wallet A and you put 100 Bitcoins into the tumbler and then you say I want it to come out of the tumbler at wallet B, it, then, they, then your 100 Bitcoins go in. You, you haven't necessarily put public information out there that you have wallet B, but everybody knows that you have wallet A. So it goes into the tumbler, tumbles the Bitcoins with thousands of other people's bitcoins and then you get random bitcoins go back into wallet b yeah, so the tumbler so takes some money can't trace the bitcoins from wallet b then to, to wallet a it yeah that's right that. yeah i suppose that's the purpose of it. well you've got a new that you've technically got new bitcoins now somebody else has got your old bitcoins yeah yeah, you can. You can. Oh, I don't think. I think I actually need to go on the tour to look at the blockchain. But the last time I was on there, the biggest Bitcoin movement that day was like. I, I and I think there's a maximum amount of bitcoins you can send, but it was was the equivalent of, equivalent of like a million dollars from China or something moving via Bitcoin. <laughs> <laughs> and you can look at that on the blockchain and just see where it's moving. Is, is bitcoins, you know how they try and block the idea of bitcoins? Yeah. Secure and, you, know, you can't kind of create bitcoins out of thin air. You can still. You can. No, you can't create them. You just explain your candle. No, no, no. That's not, that's not making them out of That's an exchange. Yeah. So you, you put them in a tumbler, and yeah. the tumbler is sort of like. Hey, before I turn this off, is there any slides anybody wanted to look at or ask me anything about? Oh, yeah. So, so PLCs don't currently have any authentication on them or anything. They're just bare. And even if they do have password authentication, they've usually got, um, because people barely ever use them, they might get done at the factory, sent off with an engine or something. You can, you can, but it, they, you can program them in the field, but if they might not always, you might get them done for you especially. But the, the thing is, because because of the different variables of how they're done, there's op, they often um, they often have like a backdoor that like Siemens knows the key key to, and so you can you can find that out. Like it's just they they don't think of people hacking them. It's only now that they have to think of people hacking them. And these things run elevators. Uh, aircraft runs um, Solaris. No, they, are used, the they would be used the somewhere, yeah. yeah. It's the basic process. 
Yeah, so. The language they use, I think it's called ladder. Yeah, it's one of them. I've seen ladder. Yeah, it's also. Oh, okay. No, that is, that is not a graphical, I think. Yeah. Oh, they, they were saying it was step seven. Step seven uses ladder? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. It's also a sequential programming language for it. Okay. Yeah, yeah, that is that is the basic one. Yeah, I've been able to do it for about ten years. Yeah, but yeah, um, but there's also one where you can actually do addition of tables, and uh, if that point to the rest of the week, we had one train that was actually easier, so it was only a pass of interest. Yeah, but you had to test it. It's just a test train. It's just a test train. It's just a test train.